right, welcome to Grimerica Goes Deep, Ancient Mysteries and Lost Civilizations. This is Chapter 6, Hyperborea. I have to pronounce that right, because I usually pronounce it wrong. Is it Chapter 6? What if we put it in before the two-parter? Might be Chapter (laughs) 5. And and Beyond the North Wind with Christopher McIntosh. Thanks for joining us, Christopher. Glad to be here. I was just looking up your work and showing Darren all the all the works you've already accomplished. Uh, you know, you're very mm-hmm. very well versed in esoteric and occult literature, and and I thought, wow, this is fantastic. And I found you through your book Beyond the North Wind, and I thought mm-hmm. I'd just start with asking you, like, what what made you choose to go uh, to talk about Hyperborea and the North Wind after uh, after all the other occult subjects? Well, um, the um immediate um, thing which led me to write it was a conference of the New York Open Center, which took place in Iceland uh, about four or five years ago. And um, it was on the the mysteries of the North. And I gave a talk there um, on the Nordic mythology. And um, after the conference on the bus back to Reykjavik, uh, I was sitting beside my friend, uh, Scott Olson, who's a professor in Florida. And he said, well, why don't you turn that talk into a book? <laughs> uh, which is which is what I did. But um, I, I was already uh, fascinated by the whole Nordic mythology and uh, all the mystique of the North. And um, look, looking back at my education... When I was when I was going to school back in the 1950s and 60s, the version of history we were taught was basically that civilization spread from the south to the north, that it all started somewhere around the region that is now Iraq, and then it went via the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans, and further and further north until all of Europe was civilized. So the the early inhabitants of Northern Europe tended to be written off as primitive barbarians. And I remember the only thing, virtually the only thing I remember being taught about the ancient Britons was that they used to dye their skin, their skins blue (laughs) with a substance called woad. So I used to imagine these mysterious blue skinned figures moving through the misty forests of ancient Britain (laughs) and occasionally grunting to each other in some primitive language. Well, um, we now know that that picture is completely false, that um, there was, in fact, a highly advanced civilization in the north long before the Romans came, long before the, the pyramids were even built. We have the, you know, we have monuments like Stonehenge, which is a, a, a miracle of engineering and um, uh, contain, uh, uh, um, is proof of, of very advanced astronomical and, and mathematical knowledge. And there are other, other sites like the Kalanish Stones in um, the Hebrides in the, on the island of Lewis, um, which um, similarly bear witness to a, a very advanced culture. Um, so... Um, that that picture of the, uh, the 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 ancient North Europeans as primitive um, is completely wrong. Um, so I, I became very intrigued by the whole mystique, uh, the whole yes history and mystique of the North, and um, uh, well, that's uh, that's, the, that's, that's the what the book is about, it. really. Yeah, yeah. So are we talking about? Do you think it's some sort of pre-cataclysmic civilization that was maybe because I'm in the middle of going through Bernard Cornwell's series right now. I'm actually not in the middle of it. I'm on the last Mm -hmm. book of the last kingdom that kind of is going through that, Mm -hmm. that early British history of that seems, you know, in a sense, very barbaric, but it also seems like it's coming from a space of, I don't know, like ice age. No, uh, this is probably like a thousand years ago, twelve hundred years ago. It more seems like it's coming from a place of um, rebirth, almost. I guess like they're they're they don't remember, or it's just the same sort of thing where they're looking at the stuff that they were building before and they don't know how they used to build it. 
Yeah. Yes. Well, I think it's a bit like that um, with the with hyperborea. Um, I mean, may, maybe I could go back um, a bit about the uh, the idea of hyperborea and where it, where it came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Be because we've talked to guests before that have talked about uh, Doggerland being around the UK when the when the water was three hundred, four hundred feet lower. You know, before yes, the young, right. before the younger Dryas, and that whole area yeah. may be connected to Scandinavia, and was I feel like this yeah. this these megalithic things came from a north that was all connected back then. Yes, I think that that could well be. But I, I just I'm just going to show. Um, sure, share your screen. Yeah, a couple. Yeah. Um, uh, can you see that? Uh, nope, not yet. Not yet. No. Nope. Uh, right. Okay. So now let's let's uh, wait a minute. I thought Doggerland was more recent than the Younger Dryas. I I don't I don't uh, think so. Um, I I don't see how that that could have been uh, could have been not flooded before the big four hundred foot uh, increase in sea level. I thought it was though. I thought Doggerland was, was like, just like a few hundred, few th maybe a, a few, few thousand, thousand years, years ago. ago. Maybe yeah, maybe. Uh, there you go. There it's. Uh, we're, uh, I think we're seeing it now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that ship. Yeah. Well, um, basically, the the idea of Hyperborea or uh, <coughs> Tula, Tula or Thula, um, as it's sometimes called, um, <clears throat> goes back to ancient Greece, to about um, the fourth century BC, when a Greek mariner called Pythias sailed from the the port of Massalia, which is present day Mar Marseille, um, in a ship that that probably looked something like this. And he sailed out through the pillars of Hercules, the Straits of Gibraltar, and out into the Atlantic and up into the far north. And he came to a land which he described as a land of fog and ice, <laughs> which may have been Iceland. We don't know exactly where it was. It could possibly have been Iceland. Um, but he, he called this, this land Tula, um, or, or Thula, or... Ultima, Ultima Tula, as the Romans called it. And this merged with the legend of Hyperborea. The, the name Hyperborea means literally beyond the north wind, Boreas being the, the god of the north wind. So um, this, uh, this legend then captured people's imagination. And, uh, for example, the... the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about it, and the poet Pindar, and various other people, and it got passed down over the centuries, um, right up to the present day, and it always it always had a, a, an aura of mystery about it. So um, that's uh, that's how the the notion of of um, hyperborea got transmitted. So the question is whether there was a hyperborea. Well, um, here we have um, a map of the the northern hemisphere. Now, uh, hyperborea couldn't have been at the North Pole because there's no landmass under the North Pole under the ice. Right. Um, but um, there are various possibilities one one is that the earth's crust has shifted if if you imagine the earth's crust like a like the loose shell of an egg which has shifted in relation to the uh, the mass in the middle so it's possible that uh, that the continents have shifted and so the north pole was originally um over a landmass and not not over water uh, so there, there are various possibilities as, as to where it might have been, and one possibility is in um, northern Russia or uh, either either in northwestern Russia, close to Scandinavia, or 
um, anywhere along the coast of the Arctic to um, the far east east of Siberia. Right. And that um, would kind of line up with the like the Puri Reese map that showed Antarctica. I think, you know, they found that map like five or six hundred years ago that shows, yeah, which shows, shows the Antarctica with the coastlines with no ice. And they don't know how that happened, which would uh, could be explained by the same phenomenon. Yeah, although um, as, as far as we know, the the Ant Antarctic was was never inhabited. Uh, whereas in the in the north, there are signs of habitation, right, and right. Um, the the Russians have done some very interesting ar archaeological investigation um, along this coast. Um, perhaps I could I could come skip to that right away. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so would that be like the basically the north coast of Siberia? Yes, this would be the coast. This would be the coast of Siberia. And then that right underneath Arctic would be like northern Alaska, right? In the top yeah, left. Yes. Yeah. The, the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, this is Alaska. This is this is the Arctic Circle, and the the Bering Straits here, which would originally which it would originally have been a land bridge, at one point, prior to the Younger Dryas. Or yeah. a coastline to sail along as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as I say, the, the Russians are very fascinated by this whole this whole uh, question of Hyperborea. Um, the the Russians are in in the um, the aftermath of the collapse of communism. They're on a kind of spiritual quest, <laughs> and um, in a way, they're um, rediscovering their, re, re, redis among other things, rediscovering their own roots and their own history. And um, there's a lot of people in Russia who believe that the Russians are, are in fact, the descendants of the, the Hyperboreans. Right, right. Uh, and <clears throat> there have been a number of archaeological expeditions uh, one back in the 1920s was led by by this man that you you see on the left, uh, Alexander Barchenko. And Alexander Barchenko um, um, went to this area here. You see what yeah, you see there yeah. is the white the white sea. Yeah. Uh, and the the Kola the Kola Peninsula just north of the White Sea, <clears throat> where he he spent a couple of years uh, um, studying the prehistoric remains, and later on, just just a few years ago, there was another another expedition which went there, and they found all sorts of very interesting things, like um, pyramids, like this one here. <laughs> I'm glad you're sharing these slides because reading your book, I, you know, it's very interesting to hear that they're actually finding some stuff like that in, in pyramids. Yeah. yeah. So uh, things like this and labyrinths. Uh, wow. uh, labyrinths. Labyrinths are very interesting because you find uh, labyrinths like this all over the northern hemisphere, um, and uh, act, act, in fact, right down into uh, the territories of the uh, Native Americans. That's interesting because there's actually a, it doesn't look like a labyrinth, but I've been to a couple locations in Alberta where you've got uh, these ancient medicine wheels that oh, yes. did look very similar to that. Yes, yes. Well, this is, is very much like the, <clears throat> the traditional Cretan labyrinth. <laughs> And um, this is this is very interesting because it's a pattern that gets repeated what's the, all over the northern hemisphere. Sorry to interrupt. What's the scale of that? Like, just say, what do you do? You roughly know what that would be from left to right, Out, uh, outside to outside. I think you can, like, you can, it's a bit hard to you tell. Can like, walk in that. Can I? Path. I can like, basically walk in, walk that, in that there. That would be to walk through that labyrinth. I think. I think it would probably be about um, five paces from. Here to the middle, yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, okay. something, yeah. Um, so they also found 
on the uh, <clears throat> on some islands in the White Sea, the Solovetsky Islands, they found things like this. What, this, what do you see on the right here? Like a giant this, throne, uh, like a giant uh, throne. A giant thr a throne carved out of a single piece of rock. <laughs> so, um, and th <clears throat> this is another very remarkable thing. Uh, this was on the island of Champ um, in the Arctic Ocean, just um, <clears throat> off, the, off the coast of the Kola Peninsula. Now, this, this island is covered with these extraordinary spheres. These, these are perfect stone spheres uh, ranging in size from about, about the size of an eyeball up to um, spheres uh, several meters in diameter. Um, yeah. So the question is, uh, how, how were they made? I mean, there, there is one theory that they're organic that they somehow developed around an, an organic core but I, I think if that were the case I don't think they would be quite so smooth and symmetrical so the, the question is who who made them and why and why yes I mean it would take quite a sophisticated technology to to make a sphere like that or, 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 or it's got to be, yeah, and that's like the same argument we had when we were looking at some of the ancient Egypt stuff in episode two. It's like, mm -hmm. not only that, they're not doing that unless it's easy for them. You know what I mean? They're not spending, someone's not spending their entire right. life, their life mission is not to make a round rock. No, right, right. Yeah. And uh, to me, it screams of uh, personal, I think of it as like industrial. I think of those round things as being part of uh, technology or machinery or something like that. Yeah, well, you'd think they would have had to have machinery uh, and at least metal tools to produce something like this. And, uh, you know, we're told that that metal was not, I mean, they, that metal didn't come into use until the Bronze Age, which was, <clears throat> what, about two, 2000 BC. Yeah. Um, and uh, then later on came the Iron Age. Um, so whether, whether in fact uh, metal tools existed long before that um, is is an interesting question. So but, while uh, you're while you're on the topic of these these artifacts and and some of the stuff they found, it, there was something in your book about the lake and the island where only the shamans can go. Oh yes, <clears throat> that's right. <clears throat> well. The interesting thing is that um, all the indigenous peoples around the Arctic Circle, from the from the Inuit in Greenland around to Alaska, Alaska, <clears throat> and the various Mongol people of Siberia, the um, Yakut and the Buryat, and so on, and the the Sami people of northern Scandinavia. They, they all have shamanic cultures, yeah. and um, yeah, as as you say, uh, Barchenko um, investigated the the Sami, and there was one particular island uh, in in the Kol Peninsula where they they had a a burial ground, which was sacred. It was it was covered with reindeer um, skulls. The reindeer being a sacred animal in that part of the world, and um, he came to the conclusion that the Sami were practicing a um, a very ancient sun cult, and that in fact they were the the original Hyperboreans. So uh, I, I find that quite a an interesting thought. So then, that, does that um, lead to the belief that all of the native cultures are somehow descended from that Hyperborean shamanic culture? Yeah, well, I think this is quite um, <clears throat> quite plausible that they they are. I mean, all all these cultures are there. There's quite a lot of evidence that they are linguistically related. The language their languages contains have certain similarities. And also genetically, they're they're related. So maybe what we're seeing in the uh, in all these indigenous people 
of the Arctic region is, uh, is in fact um, descendants of the original Hyperboreans. I wonder, uh, it seems like it would be, s what, what do you think, so what is our, do we have any idea what that timeline would be on the Hyperboreans? Well, uh, there are various theories about that. Um, it's some 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 people would would put it as far back as uh, forty thousand years uh, BC. Um, as there was an uh, an Indian writer called Tilak, uh, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, right, writing in the early part of the twentieth century, who. Um, he looked at the the ancient uh, Hindu scriptures, the Vedas, and he found references in the Vedas to a Nordic homeland. Uh, <clears throat> so, and he wrote a book called "The Arctic Home in the Vedas," where he quotes, for, for example, references in the Vedas to um, a part of the world where the the sun set rose and set um, once in the in in the year, which which is the case at the North Pole, because you have you have basically you have basically um, daylight, four months yeah. of yeah. of daylight and four months of darkness, with <clears throat> about two months um, of dawn and twilight at, at either uh, at either end. So um, and and the, the Vedas also speak about a dawn of many days and and so on. So. The description in the Veda seems to correspond exactly to the conditions in the Arctic, and he 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 puts it he puts the the, the date of the, um, the the arrival of the of these people in the north at, at about four thousand forty thousand BC. Um, others have put it around, put it much later. Um, <clears throat> the 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 ice. Uh, the ice age or the, the the yeah the ice in the north started to retreat from about ten thousand BC. Yeah, but so, 40, 40 puts it before the ice age. I think I think thirty five thousand years ago. I think was like the start. before the start of it. Yeah. So it's interesting yeah. that they go back to ju it. It sort of fits with what would happen uh, ge geologically. Well, it makes me yes. think what's interesting yes. to me is because right right now you've got this thing where everyone's sort of migrating away from the poles. Antarctica is uninhabitable. The North Pole, for most, you know, for all intents and purposes, is uninhabitable. Northern Greenland, these mm -hmm. places are extremely hard to inhabit now. But if you were looking pre-last ice age and just say, I mean, we talk about climate change now, but I mean, when you look historically, the climate's been all over the map. So yeah, I yeah, mean I right. I think you could you could easily have a time when it's too hot at the equator. Yes. So yes. you're looking to find and there's it's so hot that there's probably not a ton of ice any place except for the north and south poles. And that's mm -hmm. where you sort of migrate just to be able to have some sort of uh an existence that isn't you know unbearable. Unbearable. Yeah, well that that is a thought. Yes. And um there is there is a theory that the the axis of the Earth has shifted, and that at one point it was vertical. So that that would mean that you you wouldn't have any seasons. Uh, you you you'd have um, ba basically uh, the the sun would remain the the path of the sun would re remain at the equator. So this this would mean that the temperate zone. Would extend much further north than it does now. Huh. So that's 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 one theory. And um, we know that the the land around the Arctic Circle, I mean so, so Siberia and northern Canada, was once much more temperate. We know this from the vegetation. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, there have been the fossilized remains of palm trees found. On um, Spitsbergen, here, uh, which is only about 700 miles from the North Pole, and um, in Siberia, they found uh, the the corpses of mammoths, and when when they opened their stomachs, they found they contained grasses which 
uh, only grow in, in temperate zones. Yeah. And that weren't yeah. digested yet. They weren't digested, yeah. And, and this I mean, was this it in episode one? Was it on this show? Was it on this series in episode one where Randall showed us the picture of that mammoth? No, no, I don't that had so. There's this picture of this fossilized mammoth, and it's like pushed back and sitting up. And, and they were saying oh, yeah. that when they found it, both of its femurs were like crushed, meaning that it seems like that thing got nailed by oh. something and fossilized in that position. Oh, right. Because yes. his theory is that um, a meteor or an asteroid came into the atmosphere and like pulled in all of the basically the the warm air just escaped or like pulled down it's like a superstorm when you get a superstorm it can start pulling air down from the upper stratosphere uh -huh. where it's colder and colder while a comet can kind of sort of have the same effect which, uh, yeah. which that yeah. that was his explanation for how those mammoths were able to freeze with undigested food in their stomach that i think is like right. a three or four hour process right right yes yeah, so it must have been <clears throat> been something very sudden yeah mm -hmm. So the, and this isn't part of like this is just not even though there's this evidence, it still doesn't really shift the mainstream paradigm of history, right? Um, like they're not. They're, this is still kind of not really talked about. I think. I think that I think that's right. I think uh, mainstream main, mainstream archaeology doesn't talk very much about things like the discoveries. That, that I just mentioned, um, and well, there are <clears throat> there are other things like, for example, let yeah. me just show you. Yeah, what is, just I was just going to ask about that slide. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> now this is this is very fascinating. <laughs> the, the, these are some um, petroglyphs, as as they call pe petro um, stone spheres. They're about the size of a tennis ball, and they are about 2,000 years old. And the interesting thing about them is that these, these markings, the, 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 um, these uh, sort of protuberances on them correspond to the platonic solids, the five platonic solids, which you see uh, below on the right, tetrahedron, cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron, which um, Plato talks about in the Timaeus. Now, uh, Plato lived about, I think, about 400 BC, but these date from about 1500 BC. So they, they predate Plato. So the, the, the question is, um, where did this knowledge come from? And also, how did they... This is very, very hard stone. I think it's a, a type of very hard granite. So how did they manage to carve them when um, allegedly they had no metal tools? So how did they carve them to these very precise shapes? So <clears throat> there, there's another anomaly that's difficult to explain. There's also the fact that that like, that northern right around that arctic circle sort of line is like the richest marine life on the planet like if you if you're looking for a place to live off the ocean and stuff like that that's the place to do it all right yeah so that they could quite easily have lived from fishing yeah so is there any other uh before i move on to some other stuff is there any other sort of megalithic or ancient ev evidence um, for something going pa you know, back before our, our history of a few thousand years? Like the ca the Cavendish stones, uh, where, where, what island was that on Ca again? Uh, Cal Calanish. 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 I think I've got a picture. Yes, here they are. Is that, uh, is that in the UK or the outer? Where's yes, the outer it's, Hebrides? It's, it's, it's in, <clears throat> on the island of Lewis. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the Hebrides. And, um, uh, yeah, this is the Kalanish stones, uh, which, which again, the, these were the stone hinges on the left. Yeah, Stonehenge is a solar uh, monument, whereas uh, Kalanish stones is lunar. It was it, it was all like it's like a kind of um, a, a observatory geared to the cycles of the moon. 
So that's another example. Is that in like Scotland? Yes, uh, on, off the west coast of Scotland. And um, there are some interesting sites in the, the Orkney Islands uh, off the northeast of Scotland. Um, there's, there's one particular site, the, the Nap of Hower, it's called, which looks like just um, a couple of very primitive stone enclosures. But when you, when you look at the measurements, it contains all kinds of very complex mathematical ratios. <clears throat> contains, for example, the, the golden section and um, very, very complex kind of pr proportions be between the two parts of the site. So <clears throat> it's quite, quite clear that these people had advanced mathematical knowledge. And it makes you wonder what the coastline would be like without 400 feet of water there. I mean, Randall Carlson flipped back and forth on his coastline map and th that whole area becomes... Uh, land. I mean, and these are on right, islands right. that, you know, apparently they're having a hard time getting around, but, the, the, you know, obviously they were inhabited a long time ago. Yeah, that's right. Mm. That's fascinating. So yeah. so what about, um, is, is, is there any other uh, megalithic evidence at all that you want to show before we move on? Yeah. Uh... Or, no, or, or, or legends of searching because there are there are legends of of them searching for it and not return not finding it or not returning as well right um or is that the 1920 uh, oh, uh, expedition i'm thinking of i thought there was uh, some russian people that went and they couldn't find it or they didn't come back or something the, the, well there have there have been various attempts to to find it as early as early as the 18th century. There was a a naval expedition, the the time of Catherine the Great, but they they oh, didn't get very was. far. That's they didn't. Uh, they got about up up to the Arctic Circle and then couldn't get any further. But um, if I might just stay for a moment on the subject of Russia. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's um, a whole. Um, well, there's a great deal of fascination with the whole subject of Hyperborea, and there, there are many Russians who would like to see the Russians as the descendants of the Hyperboreans. Um, and there's a, a whole school of <clears throat> painting art, artists who paint uh, fantastic pictures of the way they imagine Hyperborea to have looked. Um, here's one. Um, one artist, uh, Alexander Uglanov. So um, <clears throat> this is one of his images of the way he imagined Hyperborea. So <clears throat> as you can see, he imagined it um, as, a, as a very a technically very advanced uh, culture with spaceships and, and uh, other, other forms of, of aircraft and these, these fantastic buildings and so on and here's another of his here's another of his paintings showing a kind of northern goddess figure uh, holding what i think is probably the pole star and um, with these sort of druid figures on either side and here's here's another one of a, a hyperborean coastline showing those spheres that I mentioned Oh, yeah, earlier. right, yeah. yeah. So um, there's a whole, in Russia, there's a whole mystique of Hyperborea. And, and, is, and what do you think that middle section is there, that portal-like thing? Is that kind of like the oh, gates well, of the, the, Valhalla this is or a kind of, or? This is a kind of a goddess, a goddess figure, I think, similar to the, <clears throat> similar to this one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's that, their alphabet? Yes. Uh, I, I, I think you wanted to talk about the runes. Yeah, didn't you? yeah, I'd love to talk about the runes too, yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> the runes are very fascinating. Um, the, um, the Nordic mythology says that the runes were revealed to Odin, the god Odin, um, as he hung on the world tree, the Yggdrasil, for nine days and nights. So it, it was a kind of shamanic ordeal. Um, and um, But uh, in fact, the runes 
they, they first appeared around the second century AD and they spread very rapidly throughout a large part of Northern Europe, uh, which, which, which is interesting because it, it suggests that they were, they were passed, uh, there were groups of, of bards <coughs> who passed, passed them on from, from one uh, community to another. Uh, now, um, there was a late, there are two runic alphabets. There's the, what's called the elder, it's called the futhark, um, because the, the, the first, because of the first, um, the first six few letters, six for the, first, the first, few, first six letters of the, of the alphabet. So there's, there's an elder futhark and the younger futhark, the elder, this is the elder one, which has, um, 24 letters arranged in three groups of H. And there's a later one which has only 16 letters. Uh, now there's there's much more to these than meets the eye. Um, they look like just very simple letters, composed of uh, basically each letter uh, composed of three different stroke, three different types of stroke: vertical, left leaning, and right leaning. Um, but um, my friend, the Norwegian researcher Harvard, Halvard Harklau, has done a very interesting analysis of the runes, dividing them into groups based on the the number of um, the number of strokes. Um, in some cases, only two strokes; uh, sometimes three or or four or five. And um, he discovered all kinds of very complex mathematical ratios. And even more interesting, he found that there was a correspondence between the runes and the Chinese Bagua system, which is the similar to the I Ching, except it has trigrams instead of hexagrams. And he found that um, the if you if you uh, you take the, the there are eight trigrams so um, if you if you um, put that together with the runes you get three runes for each uh, for each trigram and he found that there was a very exact correspondence so this suggests that there was some kind of uh, tradition of knowledge which which was common to both the uh, the nordic peoples and the chinese which is which is also an intriguing thought. Yeah, that's fascinating. And some people think they, these go back farther than that, right? Farther than a couple hundred uh, AD that they go way back. Yeah. Uh, haven't well, they found them on stones and stuff from thousands of years ago? Well, yes, there have been. Uh, there are there are sort of rune like markings that have been found on stone. Um, I'm I'm not terribly convinced by that. I think. Um, I, I tend to think that they were they were invented on on the base partly on the basis of the the Roman alphabet, partly on the basis of the Phoenician alphabet. But um, I think they were they were put together by probably by a group of bards, well, the, the the bards and the priests, the bard and priest being more or less the same function at that time. So. Um, the, re the reason I say that is that uh, because they are they are such a such a complex and sophisticated system, and they appeared so suddenly, it, it suggests that they that they were devised, they were deliberately devised, and the fact that they spread so rapidly throughout Northern Europe. Uh, also, uh, is also to me uh, uh, suggests that they were um, in invented by these bards. How did the rune um, sticks fit into those? Pardon? The rune sticks isn't that like a shamanic future telling sort of? The 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 rune what? Sorry, the sticks. Ru rune sticks. Oh yes, the oh yes, rune st sticks or staves. Yes. They're sometimes called staves. How did they use? Didn't they use? Didn't the shamans use those to like 
divine divination. divine the future or something like that yeah yes they use them uh, th this is um described by the roman historian tacitus uh, in his book germania uh, he describes how they used them for divination but they, they were also used as a, a magical system and um th there are, there are descriptions in the in the edda of how they were used for this purpose for example in one in uh, all the sagas in, in one particular saga egil's saga um is described how the the um hero of the, the saga egil egil um he is um, he told about a young girl who is sick lying in bed very sick and they ask him to see if he can help her so he goes and he finds that somebody has cast a spell on her using runes and they uh, cur cursing runes and they put these cursing runes under her bed so he goes and he takes these and um d destroys them and and and, and makes makes a, a, a spell to counteract the cursing and then she recovers so um, and there are other, there are other examples of how they, they were used for magic so but they were both a divinatory system and a magical system how how old is the edda supposed to be again well the edda well the the um, the poetic edda was written down um around 1200 1200 ad but it uh, but it's based on a a much earlier uh, oral tradition right so part of me part of me wonders if like we've got you know agartha atlantis lemuria uh, hyperborea yeah. all these sort of glo i like part of me wonders if it's all different names for one global uh pre younger dryas civilization that's highly advanced more than we think or or if it's different different cultures all coming from that part of time you know maybe the northern one is hyperborea and the mid atlantic one is atlantis and agartha might be in you know asia or closer to india i mean mm -hmm. or what well, do you think I, about that <laughs> well I, I think there are there are two two different levels here uh one one is the the level of actual historical fact and the other is the level of uh, myth and legend and i think there is a a sort of a you could you could call it an archetype it's a it's a kind of it's a motif that you find again and again uh, th throughout history uh, na namely the motif of the the far away never never land the, the far away promised land which is um al almost un almost unreachable but not quite it's it's reachable by those who are um have reached the, the the necessary stage of development to go there and um as you say you, you have the legend of agatha which was said to be an underground kingdom somewhere in central asia um there's, there's no evidence that it actually existed and so, some people claim to have the, the theosophists were very keen on agatha and some people claim to have been there um in their astral bodies but um there's there's um no evidence that it actually existed shambhala is is a similar case Shambhala, which was um, said to have been a kingdom in the Himalayas, um, the Russian artist Rurik, uh, Nikolai Rurik, was very keen on Shambhala and actually uh, conducted an expedition to the Himalayas to try to find it. <laughs> uh, and um, there's a very strong local tradition that, that Shambhala exists but it can only be seen by certain people it can only be be accessed by certain people and um, in russia there's there are similar traditions there's a tradition in russia of bielovodje the, the land of the white waters um and again again it's the same idea of this 
remote, almost inaccessible, uh, sort of paradisical place. Um, and I think that that's well, it's the same same thing with Atlantis. I think, really. Um, so uh, there may be something behind the Atlantis theory. I don't know. Uh, I mean, the first evidence we have for it is in Plato, in the Timaeus and the Critias. And Plato places it somewhere out in the Atlantic, beyond the Straits of Gibraltar. Uh, the, the, we know that there there are submerged land masses under the Atlantic, so the Azores, possibly, yeah, possibly possibly Atlantis did exist. So, what about the uh, the more of the let, let's say the more esoteric speculation of an egregore or a or morphic resonance, like Sheldrake talks about? I mean, if these advanced civilizations existed in the past, maybe we're connected through sort of our collective consciousness. Well. <clears throat> I think that I think that's very true. Yeah, I think s sometimes we may be dealing with something that's been a memory that's being that's been inherited from from way way back. Um, uh, maybe even in the in the genes. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, there are there are, there are some interesting examples of this. There, there is. Um, Evidence that the that's the, the area in Central Europe that is now uh, the Czech Republic was um, is the the land forms a crater, an enormous crater, which apparently was caused by a, an asteroid which fell millions of years ago. Um, but um, there's still the people in that area have inherited a memory of this event wow i mean yeah i mean i mean it was long it was long before h human beings even existed so uh how how do they know that it that it happened and um <clears throat> this is the, the the word the word crater um the word the word in greek the word for crater and the word for chalice is the same so there is there is one theory that this this crater became in fact the holy grail the the, the crater the, the, the sacred chalice uh, and that's that's one way in which this this the memory of this event was preserved and would partly explain why that part of the world is has such a mystique attached to it anyway that's just one example that I, that I can think of it could also be different epochs too you know like it could be Hyperborean was 40,000 years ago, and right, then the right. rock came in and yeah. wiped them out, and then it turned over to Atlantis, and, yeah, yeah. and then they got taken out, and, you know, here we are trying again. Because, I mean, if there's one thing that is apparent, it only takes us, like, 1,500 or a couple thousand years to whip some shit up. <laughs> yeah. And it probably takes Mother Nature even less time to knock that shit down. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. So why, yes. what, what do you think about the interest of, of the occult and, and the Norse uh, mythologies and magic and the legends of the Norse? I mean, it seems like everything is gaining popularity from an esoteric yeah. point of view, but the, especially the Norse. Yes. Well, uh, it, it's, it's actually been building up for quite some time. It's, it was already there in the 19th century uh, in the operas of... Richard Wagner, the the ring, the ring cycle, which is based on the Edda, um, and then in the twentieth century, you had, for example, the the Marvel comics, which um, featured, um, um, as well as as well as Batman and Superman and and heroes of that sort, they featured Thor, Thor, and. Um, like like Superman and Batman, Thor has a um, uh, an alter ego um, in 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 ordinary life, who, who periodically turns into Thor. So, um, I think there's a kind of there's a fascination with these heroic figures. Um, then I think um, there were things like 
Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which is, ba yes, it's partly based on the, well, to a large extent, based on the Edda and the Nordic traditions. I mean, for example, the name Gandalf, the wizard Gandalf, is the name of one of the dwarfs who's mentioned in the Edda. And um, Middle Earth in uh, Tolkien's story is Midgard, Midgard, Midgard yeah. in um, the um, the World Tree, where it's the, the Midgard is the abode of human beings. So, um, and the Lord of the Rings is is full of of those those sort of um, Nordic references. And uh, I think the enorm the enormous popularity of of the Lord of Lord of the Rings helped to uh, helped to um, promote interest in this this whole Nordic this whole Nordic world, the, ep the this epic world. I um, I agree. Yeah. Then, Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Then then I think Iceland uh, Iceland uh, also played a part in this. Um, I I have a personal connection with Iceland um, through a friend of mine, uh, Hilmar Ern Hilmerson, who's uh, head of the pagan community, the As As a True Fellowship in Iceland. And um, it was in Iceland, really, that the revival of the Nordic religion started in the early 1970s and then spread to other countries. And then you had... Uh, it it, sp it um, spread into pop music. You had the the, the Icelandic group Zigoros, which ha has had an, an enormous worldwide success, and then other other pop groups have followed suit. Um, and then you've got all the the films and the computer games fe f uh, featuring Nordic themes. So it's it's. Um, yeah, it's 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 hard to say why why this has all happened, um, but I think it's um, it's it's I think it's it's partly the the uh, the appeal of the the heroic and the epic, the hero's journey kind of thing. The hero's journey, yes. I I think that. Um... I always thought the Lord of the Rings was more generic fantasy. I didn't realize how tied it was to the Edda and, and Norse, the Norse stuff. But I feel like it's resonating with people because we talk about, like, let's say the hobbits in Florensis, the Homo Florensis, uh, which is really yeah. like there's evidence of basically halflings or hobbits. There's evidence mm -hmm. of giants that people talk about. I mean, the the, the themes that, that run through... Uh, the Lord of the Rings is resonating with people because if you go but far enough back, it seems like there was there was magic and giants and hobbits and and I think it's people are maybe they have this memory or morphic resonance of a of a time that was very similar. Yes, I, I think that could I think that could well be. Yeah, even dragons and dinosaurs. I mean, like if people were what were what were they thinking when they found like you know drag uh, dinosaur bones back mm -hmm. then? I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, is there anything else? I mean, we're coming up on an hour here now. Christopher, is there anything uh, else right. you'd like to touch on before we run out of time? Uh, well, do you have any any more questions? Just, um, I guess, just that that it, it's talked about in in uh, esoteric writing as well. Like Blavatsky talks about Hyperborea, and uh, yes, um, it, it's 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 a little bit more than just uh russia and norse kind of things i mean there is there is people talking about it in other circles as well right yeah and um blavatsky had blavatsky combined it with a whole system about a series of different civilizations i think she talks about five different successive civilizations and the the Hy hyperborean civilization was one of them um yeah so um yeah it has it has fed into all sorts of different and it's it's fed into literature as well i mean um the 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 uh, the writer carl um clark at clark ashton smith he, he wrote a whole series of stories about hyperborea 
Uh, do you know his work at all? No, I don't, but I'll, I'll put a link to it, though, and I'll, I'll look it up for the, for the notes. Yeah, and he's, he's, he's one of my favorite writers. He was a, a contemporary of H.P. Lovecraft, and um, he wrote uh, amazing sort of fantasy stories. And one of them is uh, one, one series of stories is, is actually, um, is act actually calls, calls it something like the Hyperborean cycle. Excellent. Did you do you want to talk a bit about your the books that you've written, um, fiction and nonfiction, before we let you go? Oh, okay. Well, I started off being fascinated by the esoteric traditions. My first book was a book, book on astrology called The Astrologers and Their Creed. And um, through writing that, I came into contact with the whole wider field of the esoteric traditions. Um, and um, I became very interested in the Rosicrucian tradition. So I, I then wrote, wrote a book on the Rosicrucians Oh, and, and in between, I wrote one about the French magician Eliphas Levy. Um, my, my fictional work, I've written a, a whole series of short stories, which are sort of about the, they're about the, the interface between um, myth and reality, ma magic and reality, which is, which is really the the, the area that fascinates me, the, the myth and myth and reality, myth and history, the way myth is always turning into history and to some extent driving history and history turns into myth. Um, so this is this is sort of what most of my writing has been about. And I've also written um, a biography of King Ludwig II of Bavaria. Um, that's um, not not particularly esoteric, but but again, it's uh, it's sort of in this. Um, he 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 was another figure who sort of had one f one foot in the world of, of of myth and another in the in the real world. Wow, um, when, that's fascinating. I mean that that fiction work really gives you creative license to explore the topics without worrying about you know historical fact. Yeah. Yes. Right. And, and so, yeah. when was King Ludwig? Uh, what 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 year was he? Uh, well, well, he lived uh, in the nineteenth century. He died in about uh, eighteen eighteen seventy five, I think eighteen seventy five or six. Um, and um, he built that famous castle Neuschwanstein, which is on on which the Disney castle in in Florida is is based. <laughs> Uh, you know that castle with all the little turrets on yeah, it. And, yeah, I think I've seen um, that. Yeah. Uh, so he was he was a very interesting figure, and he also patronized the composer Rich, Richard Wagner, and um, it was largely thanks to him that Wagner was able to uh, become famous. Write write yeah. write his works, write the Ring Cycle. Yeah. Um, so then I've written also. Um, a spy thriller. Again, that's not particularly esoteric. Um, it's called the, the Lebensborn Spy, um, and um, it's set in the, the set in the 1960s at the time of the Cold War, partly in East Germany and East and West Germany, and partly in Denmark. And um, there are just a few little references in that um, to the Nordic mythology, which. Only, only certain people will recognize. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> apart from that, it's basically just a, a sort of straight espionage thriller, The, the Lebensborn Spy. And um, I, I've also written a book on gardens because I'm, I'm very interested in, in gardens and gardening and the, um, the tradition of um, gardens with a symbolic message. Uh, which is what my book is about. It's called Gardens of the Gods. And um, yes, then, then of course, Beyond the North Wind. And that, that's about it. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, we'll point people to those works as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a fascinating subject. That the myth versus reality thing is fascinating to me because we still, 
we're still in this paradigm of materialism, but we know there's something more, you know, we're connected through our consciousness and there's, yes. there's something to this magic and this mythology. So it's, it's just truly a fascinating subject. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, huge thanks, Christopher. It's been a fantastic chat. I'm, uh, I'm interested to dig into some of this, more of this hyperborea stuff. It kind of gets forgotten mm. about or left to the side when everyone starts talking <laughs> right. about the ancient mm. civilizations. Yeah. No, it's been a been a great pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thank you for uh, for your time, and we'll we'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Bye for now. Bye bye.